welcome back to another episode of the podcast. In the studio. Here we are in the studio. We've got Colin Miller in the house. We're calling Warb up. I sent him the link about five minutes ago, so hopefully he gets it. And then we're going to be talking about drought and kind of drought conditions. I have not been dealing with any drought because here, I, mean, I guess out west in general, like everywhere I've been so far has been, I would say, like uh, wetter than it normally is. You know, a lot of places that we were hunting had a lot of green growth in September. And then when I went hunting with Greg for muleys, we were seeing tons of green vegetation down in the bottoms and even taller grass than normal up on some of the hills in the plains. So I feel that uh, it's not really something I've had to think about much, but Warb was texting and saying that pretty much where he has been hunting, there's no water. And if you find the water, you're finding the deer. So we're going to dive into that and kind of what adjustments that we make when hunting around water and stuff like that. And just kind of talk about hunting water, I guess. Hunting drought. Yeah. I actually feel like it was dry this September, but it was green. Yeah. It had been raining, I suppose. It was probably a wet summer, which allowed everything to grow really well. But then there was a lack of water. Of the drinking variety, more specifically, but I think uh, really v- drought varies a lot too, and that can happen in season. So I feel that that is something that we'll probably touch on as well. Like you could have a really wet summer, and then September, October, November come along, and you get no rain. Right? Yo, what up? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah. Hear you loud and clear. I can just see half of your all's faces, though. I can see half of Colin's face and half of your face. I only have one good half, so. (laughs) Dude, you got a sick beard. Thanks, brother. (laughs) You've been putting some time and effort into that. I combed it a lot yesterday because I was bored. I just (laughs) just got here. I just drove here. Colin's pretty tired. He's been driving for 21 of 24 hours. Yeah, your brain starts to think really weird things after, you know, hour 15, 16. It was getting weird last night, like I was 30 minutes away and it was like tip your vehicle over windstorm. Can you see us there? better there? No, nah, man, I, I'm just giving you guys crap like it's all good. <laughs> I, I mean, don't worry about it. I don't think anyway. I was driving back from... Uh hunting with Greg. I can't remember what was weirder, driving to meet up with Greg or driving home after I'd been hunting with Greg. All I remember is that both were pretty weird. I remember when we were coming back from like Mississippi and we were doing that thing with that thrashes deal and it was was just like the the middle of the night and we were, I don't know, we were on the side of the road. We were either changing a tire or like the radiator was giving us problems or I don't remember. Maybe I was just checking the oil, but it was like 2 a.m. And everybody like... was just, I mean, we were having a time. It was fun, but like we were all just feeling so strange at that yeah. point. Yeah, It starts, like, especially if you got people with you, it's not a big deal. But if you're by yourself, that's where it can start to oh, get dude. a little hairy. You start talking yeah. to yourself, just keep awake. <laughs> it's like it was getting so late, you can't call anybody anymore. Yeah, that you too. Know. Time zones are different. It's three o'clock in the morning at home. And I have that problem all the time where I'm like, oh, I'll just call, you know, anyone. Like, I always think, well, I call my grandpa or something or Ben. It's like, then you look down, it's 10 o'clock my time. It's midnight there. Like, well, I'm out of luck. And even central time. Yeah. You start running into issues, but yeah, we've made it so far. One of these days, you know, maybe we'll crash and burn because of it, but you know, keep driving, you know? Strange times eating road. That's what a lot of people don't understand is we probably spend literally like 40% of our lives just <laughs> behind the windshield. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot of time driving. You get, you get used to it though. I feel like it's funny because when I was younger, 11 hour drive would have been terrifying. And now it's like, oh, 
11 hours. That's pretty routine. Yeah. But six hours was easy, dude. Yeah. I counted them yesterday. I've done over, I've done 10, 20 plus hour drives this year. Jeez. And this year? This year. Jeez. And Just I, because you're going back and forth to Florida and stuff? Yeah, I've done, I've done the Key West drive like four or five times. That's 28 hours. Oh, jeez, dude. And, and I think <laughs> eight of those I was pulling a trailer or a boat. Oh. Like, just brutal. Yeah, once you get beyond 15, that's when things get real strange. Mm-hmm. For me, at least. Like like you said, Zinger, 11 no big deal. And like 13, 14, doable. But man, when you start getting up there, 17, 18 plus, I can't even imagine 28. We did 25 <laughs> or 26 straight through once going to Florida turkey hunting Yeah, in the Smurf. I've I never... just remember I had a new Eminem album and I just, I knew <laughs> like every single lyric. I, I hadn't listened to anything on that album until we left. And by the time we got home, I had the entire thing just basically memorized because we'd listened to it on loop so many times that's hilarious i feel uh i feel like yeah the most brutal one i ever did was the florida turkey just because i went from here picked up jake and ted in iowa we went to Catman's, and then we kept going down the next day and then just like by the time that was all said and done it was just like three days straight of driving and it was like well it wasn't straight through but you know you kind of wonder would it be better if you just went straight through versus the night and then you stay, and then you wake up, and next thing you know, you're just like, dude, I've spent like half my week driving. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if done. this is a r- Go ahead. real thing or not, but like, I feel like I get, you know how you, like you get jet lag after flying for oh, yeah. a long time? I feel like I get like that after driving real far, like Road especially life. if I do, if I don't take a break and sleep, if I just go like all the way through. I just Definitely. feel like real weird for a day after it's yeah. over with. I look, get look at this guy. I feel like he just looks road lagged. <laughs> <laughs> I slept good though. I mean, pulling in here and setting up camp. I'm sleeping. I, I pulled a 28 foot camper out here and I just pulled right in front of Zach's house, climbed in it last night and like, we're next to a park in Zach's house. Like I'm on the city streets, and I'm just sleeping in this giant toy hauler camper. <laughs> he's, I, he's, I hope nobody saw it, like saw me get into it last night. He's got a he, he's pulling. Listen to this. He's pulling this camper to Arizona. Is that yeah, right? Tucson. For a long ago ex girlfriend's grandma. He, he is who he's pulling this camper for. So he's got her truck, her camper. John Lewis has got my truck. We're going to go down there with this truck and this camper and then just play it by ear on what we're going to do for hunting. But it's just like pretty ridiculous situation of, we got Granny's camper, though. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> really yeah, scared that one. You're a good soul, Colin. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shoot. All right. Well, let's talk water and talk drought. I think first thing, like, you texted me a little bit about it, but go into detail about what you've been seeing because before you got on here, we were just kind of chatting a little bit about how everything that I've done has been kind of the opposite of a drought. I feel that there's been more rain this summer in a lot of places that I've hunted up to this point. So I guess talk about what you've seen and what's different this year compared to other years? Well, I can't speak for like out east or in the southeast, but in the Midwest, like I just talked to Derek uh, last night, and he's in south central Kansas, and they've basically experienced the same thing that we have here. So like Midwest in general has been in a really extreme drought. Northern Missouri is just cooked. I mean, the crops are nothing, especially the corn. And... I mean, no measurable rain for months and months and months on end. All the intermittent streams, which on on X, you know, are like the blue broken dotted lines. Mm -hmm. All those intermittent creeks and stuff, for the most part, don't have running water in them. Um, They they barely even have puddles here and there. 
I mean, the EH, the EH diesel has been a little <laughs> bit of a problem, but not huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the bigger the bigger story, I think, is all those intermittent streams are dry. The only place where there's any sort of permanent water is like where there's been a pond or a big lake or a permanent stream or permanent creek. And mm-hmm. even those are going dry, some of them. Mm-hmm. So you think like, well, where am I going with this? If you translate that into, into situational hunting tactics and what we've been dealing with during the early part of the archery season here, it's been largely focused on water because that's the major limiting resource right now. You know, in some areas you go to, the limiting resource is bedding. Hmm. Some areas the limiting resource is food or whatever, and we're always trying to kind of figure out what that limiting factor is and then key in on that in some way, shape, or form. And right now, it's definitely a lack of water. So, like, there's a, you know, like a buck nest area. There's big block of timber right there. Mm-hmm. You know, nearby, huge timber, mm-hmm. very little permanent water in that timber. It's all intermittent creeks mixed through. Some years when there's a heavy acorn crop, those woods are completely full of deer. I mean, bucks on every ridge, rubbing, scraping, uh, eating acorns early season. This year, there's there's a decent acorn crop, but those deer are not in there. Because there is, and that's, I I guess, I can't say this to a certainty. This is just what I've observed and just my opinion, obviously, so take it for what it's worth. But there's hardly anything in there right now, and I think it's because there's no water. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to get to permanent water, if they're in those big blocks of woods, if there's no spring-fed creek or anything or pond, they have to go, you know, long distance, half, three-quarters to a mile yeah and there's it's closed canopy forest so there's very little ground cover like uh you know succulent green uh forage on the ground that's holding any sort of moisture and like i was telling you a while ago any browse that we are finding in the woods is so dry there's the that the moisture content is almost zero and sometimes a deer can get enough water through the vegetation that it's eating uh, that it doesn't hardly even need to drink during the day. But but Ted went and set up over over a pond over there that's real close to the access. I mean, we ran trail cameras over that pond, and deer use it regularly. But it's it's a spot where we usually go into, and if it's torched with sign, we might see one deer. Just because it's right next to the parking lot. I mean, it gets pounded with people. And he saw on a hot day, like 91-degree day, crap movement day, he saw like, I think eight or nine deer in one evening set in every one of them beeline straight to that pond and was walking out there and drinking for a long period of time. It's like, man, maybe that's something to key in on. And then since then, every place we've been hunting, whether in Iowa or Missouri, whatever permanent water sources in that area, those deer are within two or 300 yards of it. Like I just walked, I, I don't know. I probably walked, through big woods yesterday i walked for six and a half seven hours straight basically uh over the same type of scenario lots of big oak ridges some acorns not as many as years past but basically void of any deer sign and i mean when me and keith were in there a couple years ago when keith killed his doe Mm -hmm. we were finding feed trees with two dozen piles of fresh deer poop underneath them in the middle of these woods and that's in just That's down 300 yards on the middle of a random ridge, and you're finding that type of sign. I walked, I don't know, six miles of that yesterday, and I bet you I found one pile of deer poop and all of that. And then as soon as I dropped off in the bottoms and got right next to those creeks and rivers that have actual water in them, it was like light switch, deer everywhere. Mm Mm-hmm. It's pretty interesting because my experience with this, like as soon as you texted me that, my mind went to the hunt that Keith and I had in uh, 2020 where it was like seven days of, or maybe eight days of pretty much as hot as it gets in November, like upper 70s and just completely stagnant wind. There was no rain. There was no cloud. There was no 
anything other than hot and stale wind. And by the end of that week, we started seeing a trend too where it almost seemed like the deer were moving off the ridge tops and just bedding closer to the creek bottoms. And that was kind of how we stumbled into our last um, close call on that trip was we were sitting up on a ridge top and same thing that you mentioned about um, the buck nest. There was acorns falling all around us. And later in the season, that became a factor that same season. But during this week, it seemed like they didn't care at all that those acorns were dropping. They just wanted to be closer to that water. And there was a couple factors that played into that, into our, I guess, our theory of why they were there. It was cooler down there. They could catch more shade. If you're up on the ridge top, you're just getting blasted with sun. And it's, it's uh, all timber, but at that point, the leaves were starting to fall. So you would just sit in the sun on a ridge top and just bake all day. And it was pretty uncomfortable. But then if you get down closer to the bottom, you know, you can catch some shade as the, as the sun moves throughout the day. And then also diversity down there. So there's more green down there and there's actually a running creek. And a lot of years that running creek, I mean, I got a video of Colin last muzzleloader season crossing the exact creek that I'm talking about. You couldn't walk across it with, you know, knee high boots. It's generally a pretty deep creek, but that year we could walk down it and I'm pretty sure we ended up taking our boots off one day, Keith and I, and sneaking down it. We were just walking barefoot. It was so dang hot that we were walking barefoot down this creek. And there was all kinds of sign down there. Now, some years there are. Some years there aren't. But in that particular year, I wouldn't necessarily say that it was a drought year all summer. But for that week long, it just dried out so much that it seemed like the deer went down there. So even if you're not dealing with the drought, like summer... Uh, long drought like what you're talking about warp i feel like it could even happen if you just got real rough conditions you know later in the season too but i i guess the reason i bring that up is that's been the experience i've had that's the most similar to what you're talking about and it's pretty much the same results deer move to the water yeah i mean they're bedding right next to it Mm -hmm. um they may not be feeding right next to it but I actually found a spot yesterday where there was a little secluded water hole next to a thick area and the water had dried up so much that there was this, I don't know what kind of grass, but it's some kind of green grass growing basically in the muddy flats of around the pond. Mm -hmm. And there was piles of tracks in it and none of the tracks were actually leading out to the water in that section of the pond. So in they were, it was feeding sign, you know, it wasn't tracks just going one direction. It was tracks pointed all different directions where they're circling and they're walking around in circles feeding. And you could look real close at the grass and see where they were nipping it off. And they were, they were hitting that stuff more than the acorns nearby. Like there was way more sign right there. I just think that, you know, like you said, in those bottoms, there's more moisture down there. Stuff stays greener longer and in certain years, like when me and Sean killed that swamp buck, I think back to that that spot because it is too. so hot and cold. Like that area is not just consistently good. It's It can be on fire or it can be void of deer almost entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, I think that's a big reason why is, I mean, they obviously move around and you're hunting, you're dealing with situational tactics all fall, but on dry years i remember that year we killed that buck specifically it was dry because we could get in the creek yes and there was a lot of years when we could never even get in that creek it was too deep and when it would run so fast some years you couldn't even put a canoe in or you'd you'd probably get flipped over because it's so fast oh yeah i mean it it get it got deep Uh but that year i mean it was just a a trickle. trickle barely and we could walk up and down that thing undetected However, it was still permanent water in that year. That bottom was loaded with deer. And I never really put two and two together. But, you know, after, you know, hunting a few more years in there and then now seeing other similar situations elsewhere, it's like, man, maybe on drier years, they they gravitate to this because in the higher elevations, the slightly higher elevations, there's no water up there unless there's a pond or something like that. In like Ted's case, there's. We're looking for permanent water in that particular area because he wasn't getting on deer immediately. 
and he went to a creek. He bumped a buck that was literally bedded in the creek that he ended up almost killing like a few days later in that same spot. And then he hunted that pond. And we're talking an area a few thousand acres in size, and that's the only two permanent water sources in there is one, one creek and then one pond. And there was deer stacked up on both. Mm-hmm. That same general vicinity that Keith and I hunted on that dry year, I think it was the next year, I didn't hunt there much or it was either it's been one of the last couple two or three years or whatever but those guys were in a similar situation it had been pretty dry and they ended up finding them right off the access in a big even bigger creek bottom yet like a almost more of a river and i would never guess those deer to be there you know of the spot it's where we've parked before Mm -hmm. We park close to this spot, and there's a big marsh there, and it's kind of a creek river bottom, and it, you know, always has water down in there. Not always a ton, but some years it's almost flooded. And in those situations, those deer go up into the hills. But I think you hear a lot of places like, um, you know, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, um, New York, you know, you hear a lot about deer bedding up high in hills or, you know, varying elevations within the hillside. But if you're dealing with a deer where it's dry, you may sh- shift all those deer right down into those marshy or creek bottom type areas. And I feel like that can be a huge advantage to the hunter, really. Oh, just figuring that, figuring that out and like putting that together saves you a lot of time because it took us several weeks of, of scouting and hunting before we started to kind of piece that in. But the opposite can occur, too. You know, on years in these same areas when it's flooded and there's been so much water that the that they're out of their banks and they're flooding across these creek bottoms and river bottoms, it pushes the deer up into spots where you wouldn't generally see them as often. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, me and Jake almost got a shot at one a few years ago that was pushed up out of a creek bottom that yeah. was just following the flood line, basically feeding on acorns. Yeah. And I, I would assume that that buck hadn't been in there recently. He probably just got pushed up there with the recent flood and the recent rain. The same thing happened to us a few years ago in Michigan up there when we were hunting during the public land challenge. Yeah. So all this thick bedding cover, this gnarly stuff along these creek bottoms in this marshland, it all got flooded out because we had so much rain. And then right by the parking lot, there's all these deer. Mm-hmm. Because the parking lot was up high on a ridge. And there was a bunch of people hunting there, but there was also a bunch of deer there because that's where they had to be. Yeah. So it, it, the conditions changing like that and keeping track of it is real important. Um, and it's, it's pretty widespread. I mean, it's across multiple states where people are dealing with this right now. Mm-hmm. Well, and I um, think even if you're not dealing with it. We definitely change our tactics. Yeah, I feel like even if you're not dealing with it right now, that's... A, at some point you're going to, and B, it might happen later this season, like in that example that I used where I don't necessarily think that year, that 2020 season was like super dry by any means, but for a long, you know, 10 day stretch, you get those same drying out conditions. It can, can make an impact on, you know, where the deer are going to be on the given day. Yeah, especially if it's warm. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, I they got. Like, go ahead, Colin. Sorry. Oh, I feel like paying attention to it, especially being on it like really early in the year, allows you to make the micro adjustments throughout the whole season, right? So it starts to rain, and like if you get a couple days of real heavy rainfall, you can immediately make those micro adjustments to know that hey, they're probably going to be pushed up a little bit because they don't have to be down in those bottoms anymore. Mm-hmm. And if you stay on top of it. It just helps you keep in front of the deer, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're they're they got winter coats growing in right now. You know that hair is way longer come November when you shoot a deer in late November. I mean the the coat is way different than if you shoot them in September. Mm-hmm. You know September even early October you got short hair. And then by late November it's an inch and a half longer than that. So if you're talking about a a stagnant period during the rut when it gets real hot like that and they got winter coats on think back to how how to deer bed in the summer when it's 95 
they Down go the and they bed right against the water in those yeah. creeks. Mm-hmm. And and you when you bump them out of those beds, you understand why because it's 10, 15 degrees cooler down there than it is elsewhere. Like you said, if the if there's no leaves on the trees and the ridges are getting smoked during the day, they're not just going to lay up there and pant. Yeah, they're going to go to a lower area, maybe a spring fed creek or uh, you know something with a sandy bottom that's cooler that's lower, that's got permanent water, and they'll just hole up right next to that stuff. I mean, I, that's where, that's how Ted bumped that buck. That was on October 2nd. Yeah. That thing was laying in the bottom of the dried up creek bed. I think the advantage of like a year where you've got a, a summer long drought, your creeks are dropped, and a hunt that I also wanted to talk about was the one that you had with Sean. The advantage with that is you can walk those creeks and they're great track catchers and they're great places to just read sign and move quietly, cover a lot of ground, and then hone in on a specific area. And that's pretty much what you guys did that season, right? You guys found big tracks and then revisited it, correct? Oh, yeah. And you don't leave any ground scent in that creek. Mm -hmm. So, or very, very minimal ground scent. I mean, any deer that came across our tracks in the creek did not pay a lick of attention to it. You know, however, you pop up out of that creek and you start walking through chest high grass, you're leaving piles of ground scent right there Mm -hmm. um, as you're going through the actual bedding area. But those creeks are awesome because if they're if they're running through a bedding area on multiple sides or a thick creek bottom or whatever, where a lot of travel is is happening, you can cut those tracks and a lot of like you said, they're great track catchers. So you can look at the tracks you can analyze them see if there's big tracks in there and you can see which trails they're coming and going on all of a sudden you find a, a few sets of big tracks going both ways coming down to the creek and going up um then you you know you start to deduce like there's a big buck in here that's watering at this that's drinking from this creek and he's coming and going from this particular spot mm-hmm. and you didn't bump him out of there like you said that that first hunt we went in there we cut tracks, we popped up out of there, saw a bunch of big sign, we set up and we saw a pile of does and young bucks. A week later, we went in there on a front morning, a uh, little better time frame, like closer to Halloween, we killed the buck on the 30th, and we did the same thing in the dark that morning, except we went the opposite direction. One morning we went to the right up the creek, or one evening i guess and that's when we saw all those does and the big signs so like we confirmed there's a bunch of deer in here a bunch of does and there's some big huge rubs so there's got to be at least a buck or two in here we'd shoot then the next time we went in there we went left up the creek and as soon as we did that we started cutting bigger than average tracks and lots of them we basically just followed those tracks up out of the creek where the majority of them went then we went 100 yards through the bottom, cut a fresh scrape, and set up in the dark. And that was as simple as it was. I mean, it wasn't – we just got – well, the reason we went left that morning, though, is because we had a a wind out of the west so we could go into the wind. You know, and the other time we hunted in there, it was a wind out of the east, I believe, so we were going into the wind. So when we cut sign, we could pop up into the wind, and we could set up and have everything out in front of us that's not smelling us. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was fairly fairly straightforward though as far as reading tracks goes it was super easy in that creek when i think of ground scent too in a water situation something that i've been thinking about here in the last month or so specifically with elk but i kind of think of it the same exact way with deer when you've got a drought year those animals have to go to the water not just the deer either though so do the bears and the lions and the uh, whatever you know coyotes wolves whatever else you're dealing with so when you think of even in a whitetail situation i don't necessarily think that they get to water and expect to not smell predators because they know those predators also have to go to the water too so like you know for a, a buck in north carolina on a dry year to come across a creek uh, a spot where a creek crossing and smell bear tracks on it probably isn't that uncommon because those bears are doing the same thing. So when they smell us, I think maybe they're a little bit more lenient. This is just a theory again, just something that I've 
kind of made up in my head. I don't know if, how you'd get any truth unless you asked a deer, but uh, I don't think that'd go well for you. But, you know, if you if you think about it, everything has to go that water. You'd assume they know that, or you'd assume they're used to that on those years that they're more funnel, or uh, maybe not funneled, but... Concentrated. Yeah, concentrated force to go there. So are the predators, so... I don't know, that's been something I've been thinking about and makes me feel a little bit better about checking a water hole, for example. Like, you find that pond, it's like, ah, oh, man, do I want to leave my scent over there? And it's like, well, you know, a bear wouldn't care. He'd just roll right up and leave his stank all over that hole, so. <laughs> yeah, they don't, I don't, they don't care as long as there's not like a bunch of high vegetation in there. Mm-hmm. That's the only time when I've been busted uh, with ground scent, regardless of where we're at, is... Mm-hmm. If you're in high higher vegetation that's brushing against like your coat and your pants and stuff that's that's the stuff when they'll walk by and they'll smell that and sometimes sometimes they don't care at all mm-hmm. it just depends on the deer but man when you're in a when you're in a creek bed and you're walking right against the water's edge i mean like you said that that makes sense too everything is walking down there all the time so mm-hmm. there if there is any ground scent they're used to being confused essentially right there because Mm -hmm. there's so many so much other activity in that area that they're accustomed to it's like you know if deer walk across a you know a walking trail a hiking trail at night or your yard at night or a road at night they encounter human scent all the time in those areas Mm -hmm. they don't care about it in those spots because they're used to it yeah where they don't like it is if they're if it's in their bedding area right there where they're laying and they're they're smelling it and it hasn't been there before that's a little different yeah yeah but i agree that's what we've seen so far that and the the burns have been interesting hunting hunting uh prescribed fire or recent prescribed fire for deer which is something that i feel like we haven't done a ton in the past we do it all the time for turkeys Mm -hmm. but Man, we've seen a lot of deer in burns. I saw I saw a burn yesterday that was torch was signed, and everything in that burn was just way greener than the rest of the woods. That's what I was going to ask. Are you seeing more green vegetation popping up in those places, and, and could that be why? Because everything else is kind of scorched by sun and dried out by sun, but in these places where you get this fresh green growth, maybe it's a little more tender for them to eat, I guess. I don't know. It could be. And acorns uh, are easier to get to, you said. I think that's the big thing is like when deer are feeding on acorns, this is this is one thing. This is a conundrum in my brain, I guess. We were hunting on an area the other day. Sorry, I might go down a rabbit hole a bit here, so <laughs> it's all I apologize if I you know go left and right and which way or whichever. Um, but we were hunting a big managed area the other day. They do a ton of habitat work, which is awesome to see. But they did so much select cutting throughout that it makes it almost too big of a thick area i mean in in their when they're select cutting they're you know they're doing that crop tree release stuff on the mm-hmm. oak trees so that they produce more acorns and they did like that particular area has been scorched dry and there is way more acorns on that place and i'm assuming because of the management that they're doing like they're they are eliminating the closed canopy forest and trying to turn it back into a woodland setting. Mm -hmm. And those trees are 100% producing more acorns than anywhere else I've been this fall. However, it's been cut like a few years ago. So all of that woody stuff has come back and it's really, really thick at ground level. And I'm just wondering, there's deer in there, but they're they're along the edges of it they're not in the middle of that and i'm wondering if it's because they don't feel safe feeding on acorns because acorns are obviously on the ground when they fall and i don't know that a deer likes sticking their head down in a bunch of real thick stuff and feeding where it can't see any anything coming Mm -hmm. because if if all of a sudden you find an oak tree that's dropping acorns on a lane or the edge of a field or a burned area where everything's cleaned off of the bottom they're they're piling to them Mm -hmm. they're stacking up in there even a closed canopy forest setting if you find a big oak tree in closed canopy forest with no ground growth at all and there's a bunch of acorns just sitting on top of low leaf litter they'll go and hit that thing more often than they will the one that's dropping acorns in the middle of a thicket 
Yeah. I agree with they, that, too. They still have to have that. Like, they're going to feed on that woody browse, and they're going to use that at, at certain times of the year. But, you know, in this short window when they're really keying on, in, on acorns, we found all the sign along the edge of those select cuts, not in the middle of them. When, we, when we're muzzleloader hunting and we're hunting clear cuts, it's the same thing. They're like concentrated around the edges or um, the logging roads. Or you, you mentioned lanes, same thing. It, it, it's like right on those spots, they can actually get their head down to the acorns or they can bed there and see a little bit and then have a quick escape too where if things get too thick, then they don't seem to be real deep in that where... I'm thinking of some of these huge clear cuts that we've hunted in like Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, those are two examples that come to mind, but you know, it's kind of all over the place, right? Anywhere where there's timber, if you find a cut like that, it doesn't seem like they're very often smack in the middle of it. There are some rare occasions, but it seems like for the most part, they're kind of out on the edges or in those places that they can move easily. And even back to the browsing thing, it's like thinking about a deer just walking along the, a logging road, just browsing his way. You know, he can still see both directions if he's on that road. And then if he needs to bail, he can dive through the thick stuff. But like, you know, path of least resistance. Sometimes I feel that hunting public land and trying to always get creative and, and think outside of the box, sometimes I focus a little bit too much on thick stuff and overlook that simple path of least resistance and, and easily overthink things because when you find them in an unpressured location, they're going to take those paths of least resistance rather than burying themselves in the middle of the, the cut. What we did see, though, is those select cut areas that had been burned, the deer were all over the whole thing. Yeah. Like, they, were, they weren't just focused on the edge now we did see a lot of them along the edge but we also saw a lot of them in the middle of those burns mm -hmm. and these are huge burns i mean they're three four or five hundred acre burns and if you walked way out in the middle of them if there was some kind of permanent water out there there would be deer yeah. in the middle of those things they still use the edge a lot but it just seems like that when they burn it uh you get all that green vegetation like you mentioned that's more succulent, it's got more moisture content in it, and it's just, it's that early succession green browse that they like, forbs and all that stuff. And that stuff stays greener than a food plot does because the roots go deeper on it. Yeah. And it's, I, I, at least I think so. I mean, you have to check with Admin Matt or somebody that does land management, Kyle Eibarger, whatever. Uh, but I, at least that's my understanding is those native natural browse species have much deeper root systems that pull moisture from down deeper than some food plot crops that you may be putting out there that are that their roots are only going just below the surface mm -hmm. well yeah I mean, that's what we about... notice at, at our farm like the food plot up there is completely scorched but if you go down in the timber um in the stuff that they burn last winter there's green browse in there yeah yeah, you think about like a soybean, even like those roots aren't very deep and they're a super dry plant, especially as you get into this time of the year. And it's like you compare that to something that's, you know, even something that's turning colors as well. If it's got a deeper root system, like you said, and it's pulling more moisture, certainly that's got a longer lasting benefit as far as a drought year goes. You, you would assume at least, I guess, again, all maybe just our opinions and theories, but it seems like it's something that is going, I mean, you look at the buck nest as a great example. You've got a creek down there and you've got all this diverse habitat down in that old field. And it's just like insane how long those deer stay down in there. I mean, we've seen deer in there into, I mean, real, really every month of the season we've seen bucks down in there over the oh, years. Oh, they just never leave, mm -hmm. almost. I mean, they don't need to because it's so diverse. They have mm -hmm. something there that they're keying in on at any given time. And there's mm -hmm. there's oak trees close by where they can get to acorns. There's ag fields close by where they can get out there and they can feed at night and stuff. But there's so many more species in permanent water in the nest that they don't that's where that there's it's no surprise now after we've been in there and hunted many years why they use it so often yeah it makes it makes total sense
But I'm also I'm also curious from the land management standpoint. I need to ask Matt and Adam about this. But you know, the these agencies they manage they always tend to manage these areas on a large scale basis. And that was the case at this this big managed area where Hayden and I were hunting. And like I said, the habitat was was solid. There was definitely more deer and more turkeys per square mile on that area because of the habitat work that they're doing. I have no doubt because I've been seeing the same thing on our farm since we started doing stuff. However, those guys at Matt and Adam are always talking about like a mosaic effect, not like a gridded out block here, block here. And they also say, you know, large burn better than no burn, small burn better than large burn. And I'm also wondering if it's, if it's the same with cutting. It's like mm-hmm. large cut better than no cut, small cut better than large cut. What I mean by that is, man, when they came to my farm, uh, you know, up there at home, they cut an area that was maybe a half acre. Mm-hmm. And they were like, this will be a bedding area. He said, guarantee you, there will be deer bedded in here almost every single day. I'm like, you only fell like... 10 trees in here and hinge cut another seven or eight and like doesn't matter you can see this little pocket right here sunlight it's going to get right here and deer are going to bed right here in this spot and i am not kidding you every single time that we've hunted back there deer have come out of that bedding area since mm-hmm. and i didn't hardly see one for 15 years of hunting before that come out <laughs> yeah of yeah i mean and they they said okay deer are going to go from this bedding area this little half acre chunk to this little quarter acre bedding area we made across the ridge and he drew a straight line from him. He's like, you're going to have two or three trails going right through here. He said, so cut this fence right here so they can get through here. Boom. They go. They just go back and forth, bucks do during the rut. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, how do, how do you guys just know that? Like, how do you know that after walking on this place for 10 minutes and running a chainsaw for two hours? Yeah. And that is exactly what happened, dude. In those, yeah. But that's my point, I guess, I'm getting at here, or my theory is uh those bedding areas are little they're not big 400 acre select cuts mm-hmm. they're quarter of an acre half an acre you know and they're just these little blocks on the landscape no different than like a kill whole food pot if you yeah. will yeah it's like oh, would we be better off taking these landscapes and just running in there and doing just a little bit here and a little bit here a little bit here and just dotting fire all over the place instead of going in there and blasting huge areas right and and obviously we don't have control over that on the big the federal scale when they're doing those big federal public lands but on some of the smaller state-owned stuff it might be more cost effective to do that in some in some sense because it take less manpower and you would you might be creating an even more suitable habitat because i mean the work they're doing on this place is I, I mean, I guarantee you that's why there's more deer out there. Mm-hmm. And some areas don't get any attention. So, I mean, just, just getting them to do anything is yeah. important. But I'm, I'm curious if the mosaic effect is, is like the cream of the crop, you know. Yeah. If that's like your – that's the peak of the mountain as far as land management stuff goes. Well, I think of Larry's place. They get that place. Have you been there yet? I've been there a bunch. I hunted there not last year, the year before we deer hunted there. Did you? Yeah. So when you're there, you see all these different management zones, mm-hmm. like with on a ridge. And there's, I mean, it's a sweet property. It hunts a lot bigger than the area itself is on paper, I guess. It's 88 or 79 acres or whatever. And it's like, because of the ridges that pop into the valley that runs right through the middle of the 80 acre property those ridges are all broken into multiple management zones. They got fire breaks in there. So like to your point, like they're managed in these micro scales. So every weekend that they go back in there, they do a little different thing in a different zone. And because of that, there's all these different bedding areas on the property. And then there's still some open hardwoods as well, kind of on the, I guess it would be uh, the the far side away from the barns. I yeah. can't think of my orientation right now. Maybe the south side, but um, a lot of the stuff that they're seeing these mature bucks in year in and year out since they've started creating this habitat are coming from these little pockets that aren't that 
crazy in size. You know, we're talking an 80 acre parcel like that. That alone is not a ton of land to, um, I guess it's not a ton of it's a, it's plenty, but it's it, but it's uh, I guess not as much as what you're talking about in some of these situations where there's hundreds of acres burnt. It's like you're dealing just 80 acres so that when you have those little micro spots, it seems to be really helpful. And then another thing that I constantly think about on private land that you're managing and and really ties into this um, drought conversation is the water hole thing. Like yeah. thinking about how many private land places don't have a pond, don't have a creek, and then how sim- a simple water hole uh, that you put in can just create all this opportunity for wildlife. I mean, the best example I ever have is is uh, when Barber put the kiddie pool at the place that he yeah. hunted a lot as a kid. We literally rolled up there October 30th or something, very first morning, walk out there, rattle, buck comes right to the water hole, he shoots it, and it's like the most ridiculous, you know, ridiculously straightforward thing ever. But, you know, in that situation... There's a lack of pressure. There was permanent water because of this water hole he had created. And therefore there was, that buck had been living there. Like he was getting pictures of him on the water hole. So it was not oh, yeah, really all a the huge time. surprise. And Chantel killed one there too. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't she? Yep. I think so. Yeah. I think, and and she, she had pictures of that. They had pictures of that buck also going to that water. I mean, if you really look at it, like when you think about a drought, just think about the whole state of Texas, right? <laughs> when they hunt in Texas, they hunt over troughs. They have, they pretty much have to because it's so hot and so dry that they always create these permanent water holes in their, you know, they might be cattle troughs, mm-hmm. but that's where the deer are. Everything has to, everything because has to use them. You're, oh yeah. Did you all see desolate. the trail camera pictures that Nick had? Mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, everything's got to use them. They got hogs on that thing. They got bucks on it. They got does. They got fawns. They got turkeys. Like every day, it's just a revolving door. Mm-hmm. But they live in a drought situation, basically. Constantly. So. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. Versus. So if you don't have water, like <laughs> you don't have life, you're, you're kind of screwed. I mean, yeah. yeah if you don't have water, you don't have life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think about an elk, like. And I think an elk's got to have water even more than a deer does because mm-hmm. they're so much bigger. Like, they have to drink water every day. It seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. The The only thing, the only animal that I still can't, and I just have the least amount of experience with, is the old thirsty whitetail, also known as the mule deer. How yeah. they survive out in the middle of I nowhere no sometimes, idea. it blows my mind. But they just I don't, don't know. drink water, man. Colin and I started making the joke a couple of years ago. We were watching these mule deer, and over here you got mule deer out in the middle of nowhere where there's no water. And then you're watching all the whitetails come out of the creek and river bottoms. So we just started calling the mule deer thirsty whitetails. It's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how they don't drink do. water. but <laughs> they're, they're within a mile of each other, but you never see them together. And there's no water up there. This was <laughs> South Dakota. Yep. It's like, it, that was, it was a dry year up there. And yeah, that was really dry, too. That year there was deer dead from EHD that we were finding. Pretty, pretty heavy. Probably the most I've ever seen. There was a lot. There was a little depressing moment in that one video that we have where it's like, two or three in a row that we see on the same road and it's kind of like ooh, this yeah. didn't make you feel so good <laughs> the old eh dizzle boy <laughs> it'll that's get them it's a dream breaker em. right there <laughs> yeah. breaking hearts a lot of videos yeah. pop up this time of year of people you know having big heartbreakers there's a lot of depressed whitetail hunters out there because of the eh dizzle <laughs> usually bad. doesn't kill them all actually never has nah they'll be all right He'll come back. Um, well, is there anything else that you think of when you think of drought? Anything else you want to talk about as far as that goes? I don't think so. That's kind of everything that I've found here rec- recently. I'm fixing to try to get out here in the woods here in the next couple of weeks and see what else I can learn. But acorn crop this year and has definitely been very sporadic where we've been. And I was, I was – was worried about the drought coming into the fall and like how it would affect acorn production, even if it does. But man, on that heavily managed area, like I was telling you about, mm-hmm. there's freaking acorns all over the place. Yeah, and they ain't had hardly a lick of rain in months. Mm-hmm. But they are there are so many more acorns there. I think a strategy like 
in a lot of places uh, that I'm excited about just applying this season is walking or paddling creeks. I love doing mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's just something that we've had so much luck doing. And a couple of the places that I'm planning to hunt this season should have good opportunities for that. And I think I just think of the buck nest and like all the fun times we've had hunting there just just simply because you can still hunt down a creek and and look at those tracks and then you can hone in very quickly and i mean done that in iowa ohio uh, even done it some in yeah some of the western states i mean there's just all kinds of examples of it and i feel walking creek bottoms is just something i enjoy doing it sets up well for an impatient character like me but also helps you hone in on a spot really quickly you find crossings you find you know, bedding areas, all kinds of things. And yeah, it's just, it's something that I feel as the season progresses, we're all going to probably keep doing more and more of that, especially as we hunt these dry areas. So it'd be pretty fun. Yeah, that's my, that's my plan. It's just in these big hills trying to figure out the wind down there. Yeah. So when you get a situation where the creek, you know, runs one direction and you can get a wind coming right down it, mm -hmm. uh, then it seems to behave a little bit better. But, man, if you're down in the bottom of a hole with big, steep ridges on either side and that and wind's it, coming over the top, yeah, it's just tumbling down through there. Yeah. Yeah, and if so you have, you like, have to a... figure that out. I think but, the one spot that we were hunting that one year, there was a south wind. The creek was running north and south, and the thermals were pulling slightly uphill, so it was perfect. We were right on the edge of the creek with the wind coming just ever so slightly up towards us or, you know, up from the creek up the hill. And it was perfect for the setup that day. Um, but, you know, that's a rare situation because, like you said, if you got more ridges coming down and that creek bends around those ridges, it's going to be real tricky. But one thing that I feel, you know, Warb, you and I have talked about for a long time now is just trying to utilize a little bit in the morning or a little bit in the evening where you've got the wind kind of calm and thermals are just more predictable. Like maybe you set up down there in the morning and hope to just get a little rise to where your scent, you know, is not necessarily going a direction constantly. It's maybe more or less just rising up. But then as soon as the wind starts to pick up, you're probably going to have to adjust or in the evening slide in there and catch those thermals pulling down into those creek bottoms. I mean, those are two quick examples of ways that i feel like you get away with it but yeah it's still super tricky especially if you want to set up you know on a crossing all day trying to catch a cruising buck you're going to be rolling the dice there often you know yeah man it seems like we always have better luck when it's calm down there mm -hmm. and that's the good thing about hunting uh hunting a creek or a river or water a body of water when it's calm is if you're using a boat or even if you're even if you're walking the creek bed it's possible to be really, really quiet down there. Oh, yeah. Where if, if you're walking a one of these ridges in the drought with leaves up there, when it's cold, <laughs> you're, you're blowing stuff out from 600 <laughs> yards away, even if yeah. you're trying to be quiet. Oh, yeah. You're, I mean, everything is just focused on you. If you're going in an hour before daylight and you're walking down the center of a ridge in big woods at its crunchy leaves, like, nah. They, they, they piece them out. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. They're yeah. out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I guess we got to get ready to go elk hunting. I still got about a million things to do before we do that. So I guess I got to go to Iowa. Muzzleloader um, starts tomorrow, eh? Yeah. I'm trying to get up there to the cabin tonight so that I can run around with the guys and film them this weekend or edit yeah. or whatever needs, needs to be done. Yeah. You watch that video and all the fun when somebody gets one down and it's like, man, I hadn't been a part of anybody getting anything down yet. So yeah, I was there for Jake's and then I was pretty butthurt when Ted got his <laughs> and I'm sitting down here moving boxes and stuff around like, yeah, dude. Yeah. but yeah. I'm fixing to be there this weekend. Something's going down here in the next couple of days. The ball's rolling now. It's going to be, I feel like the rest of October, we're going to just keep that ball rolling. So hopefully, yeah, man, once we, know. if we get the ball rolling this time of year, it's usually good things that are fixing to happen. Pruka got one yesterday. It looked like too. Oh yeah. I got him a dandy yesterday. Dirt yep. and good one. Yeah. Good and buck. I guess <laughs> Jake, Jake and Nick helped him get it. He had to put another arrow in it because the shot was back, but they, they found him 
you know, tracked him and found him alive. So Pruka got another arrow in him and, you know, was able to keep all that meat and everything. So that's it worked good. out. Yeah, that's um, good. But that's the yeah, scary they've thing. been hitting the dirt and it ain't even, what is today? 13th. 13th. I mean, and a lot of them been hitting the dirt in the mornings, which yeah. is something we need to talk about at some point. And I was, my, my buddies, uh, Aaron Golson and you know, Zach Kurzieski. Oh yeah. They both killed bucks. I was, I was actually, I just got done elk hunting and I was getting their messages coming in. And I also got a notification from some hunting magazine or whatever that said 10 reasons not to hunt mornings during the early season. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. at the same time, I'm getting the, these messages from my buddy Aaron Golson and from Kurzieski. He's like, killed this buck opening morning. And then, oh, yeah, I also killed this buck opening morning. And then second morning this season, my buddy killed this buck. And it's like, okay, we probably needed to discuss this at some point. Yeah, and I mean, it's something Ted we've talked about. just killed that one early morning, you know. we I. I just think at some point, we, I, I know if if we're not careful, we'll go down the rabbit hole, but at some point yeah. we got to talk about early season mornings because we hunt them way less than we do in the evening and we've killed just as many bucks, if not more, in the morning. Yeah. I love a good morning. Early season. There's nothing better in the morning because at the very least, you can set yourself up for a confident evening hunt even if you don't get one in a lot of morning set up. So it's just, I just love a morning. I'm so optimistic in a morning. An evening, I'm not always so optimistic. But a morning, you got the whole oh, day. Yeah, but Colin you, know, Colin, you know old Zinger's got that black gold rolling in the morning. He's got that <laughs> coffee pot stirred up as soon as he's know, out the tent. I also know that he doesn't love a morning enough to go fast in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he his speed picks up once he gets that caffeine in him. Mm -hmm. That's so true. He's, he's slow until he gets that that little that coffee drip in the morning, and then he's got that, and boy, the mood the mood just goes to the moon from there. Oh yeah, I've learned that if you want the morning to start solid and fast, you make the coffee. Like, <laughs> yeah. if, if I wake up and the first thing I do is put a pot of coffee on while Zach's fumbling around doing whatever he's got, whatever he thinks he's got to do right now, and then you just have a pot, cap, cup of coffee for him, dude, it, it changes the day. Oh, he turns into Superman once he gets that coffee in him. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it gets weird. <laughs> uh, hey, oh, man. To, you know, get there however you can, and for me... It is that black gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> might go yeah. brew. I might go make some right now and see if we can't get out to the elk woods before midnight tonight. <laughs> there you go, Colin. Man, I hope you get one, dude. I'm pulling for you. We're looking forward to it, man. Well, at, at, at the very worst, we're gonna have a lot of fun. I tell you yeah, that for man. free. You are. Yeah. At the very least, we're gonna learn a lot. I feel like this yeah. is gonna be an experience where we learn a lot because we've only ever done a rifle hunt once before. And we learned a ton on that, and this one's going to be different. So, yeah, we'll see. It, it's going to be very different than you know what it was two weeks ago in yeah. September. So I've never done a rifle elk hunt like this, and I think it's going to be a learning experience for sure. And he's got a new hat, so yeah, and I got I've a seen new hat. that. Man. Hopefully, we're going to knock one down, man. If you knock one down like that, we're going to be in good shape. Yeah, y'all cats, get out there and get after him. I'm going to head right. up there and try to help old Ted get him a buck here in the next day or two. Hell yeah, brother. Well, good luck and keep safe and we'll talk soon. See you, fellas. Good See luck. See ya.